Zanquia al
Hello everybody, buongiorno a tutti. Uh, parlerò in inglese perché questo seminario organizzato da Luis e Ambasciata del Giappone è un seminario internazionale che si rivolge a un pubblico internazionale. So, thank you everybody, thanks for being here and thanks to Luis University who helped man and managed to organize the seminar. We tried to do it on, um, in person last year, but of course due to the pandemics we needed to switch. Uh, modality of this seminar and Louis staff. Uh, let me thank Alex, Alessandra, um, Domenico, and uh, uh, Maria. They were really helpful in organizing all of this. Of course, we thank the Embassy of Japan in Rome, who's represented here today by Minister Hirota, and uh, for the support. Um, and also, we thank the Louis authorities because today we have the honor of having here. Uh, Dr. Giovanni Rostorto, who's always been really supportive of this, of this initiative and always thought that demographic was an issue we needed to talk within the sustainability debate in Lewis University. And I think um, also, let me thank Professor Sebastiano Maffettone, who couldn't be here. Uh, he's the organizer, along with the embassy and university with Ethos Think Tank, uh, but he couldn't be here because of a health issue. Uh, sudden health issue, but he will get back well and uh, he will help us in continuing this uh, debate. Um, Professor Maffettone uh, helped us in having uh, Professoressa Corrao, who will manage the first hour of the meeting. Um, and so I would just uh, say that we can start maybe with the greetings from uh, Dr. Lostorto and Director General Lostorto and then uh, Minister Irota from the Embassy. And thank you very much. Thank you for following and uh, have a nice day now and have a nice uh, work here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marco Valerio. Um, I'd like, uh, first of all, to sincerely thank the Japanese Embassy in Rome and Italy for their most generous support, also in terms of the organization of this um, uh, seminar. My thanks also to the uh, Ethos Observatory, Professor Sebastiano Affettone, uh, and these researchers uh, for having realized such an eminent uh, panel. Thank you to the uh, participants, to all the participants, and uh, to the authorities present in the audience, the minister you mentioned before, especially Professor Giancarlo Blangiardo, President of Istat, and Ruishi Tanaka uh, from the University of Tokyo. My personal great also to Professor Golini. We, we had uh, a great experience in demography, uh, publishing uh, a book of Professor Golini few years uh, ago. And of course, all the ladies and gentlemen attending uh, the event. I guess, uh, as, as you, as you uh, said uh, before, I guess, uh, as passed since we first conceived together with the Japanese embassy, the idea of discussing the challenges associated with demography, with the aim of understanding how population change can impact the economy, society, and culture of both our uh, nations. Two countries linked by the highest longevity uh, rates on the planet. The COVID-19 pandemic and the deaths among the elders uh, have made such reflection more pressing. I do believe that partnership with the, the uh, Japanese embassy and the Tokyo Foreign Ministry uh, is, the ex is extremely valuable. Japan was among the first in the world to deal with the consequences of the intense aging of its population on uh, and uh, a low birth, birth rate. The impact of this phenomenon has become a national priority which now could serve as inspiration. Let's look at the reorganization of the healthcare system and the technological innovation to support the population, its workforce and uh, industry. In Italy, the unemployment rate of 15 to 29 uh, year olds uh, uh, is 21.7% uh, higher than EU average of 17.1%. Uh, and 27.6% of 30 to 34 year olds uh, have graduated compared to 41.8% in the EU. And uh, most important, 62% of them see their life project at risk. And that's uh, on our 
uh, shoulders as a responsibility, um, personal responsibility of our um, work, today work. Um, from the analysis of our economists, sociologists, and jurists, emerges that a country shaped to suit young people, women, and children is a country where people work more and better, innovate and produce in order to become fully sustainable. Today, on this occasion, it is indispensable to listen to the reflection offered by the Athos Lewis Observatory. Uh, of our business school, whose main objective, as said by Professor Maffettone, is to examine the issues of contemporary society from an ethical uh, perspective. In conclusion, I would like to quote one of the most eminent philosophers of the last century, uh, Hannah Arendt, who in her book, The Human Condition, identified the solid link between both and the birth, sorry, and freedom. The miracle that saves the world from its normal and natural ruin, said um, Han Arendt, is ultimately the fact of the birth rate. It is the birth of a new man and a new beginning, the actions they are capable of by virtue of being born, hope and freedom, the ability to act and accomplish the improbable. All this will serve us to address one of the fundamental themes of our times. Before I finish, I'd like to tell you that I'm trying to start in learning Japanese uh, with the help of my assistant, and I am honored to say, Minna san, kokoro kara, arigato gozai mashita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Giovanni Lo Storto. Thank you for your intervention and your uh, greetings. And again, um, I need to say that uh, Dr. Lo Storto has always been present in pushing uh, the thinking and reflection about demographics within Louis University from an economic point of view, sociological, and as he said today, from an ethical point of view. So thank you uh, very much. And uh, Prof uh, Dr. Rirota, uh, the floor is to you for your greetings, thanks. Uh, we can't hear you well, you should- uh, Okay, do you hear me? Okay, so I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the Ruiz University, which organized this interesting seminar, and in particular, to Mr. Giovanni Lostrotto for having invited me to participate. I promise my speech will be very, very brief in order to leave to our illustrious expert the appropriate time to enlighten us with more interventions. The title of this seminar, The Italy and Japan, the Population Challenge, Sustainable Demographics for Flourishing Societies, immediately highlights the common aspects of bringing together our two countries, which despite being so far geographically speaking, actually shares many social, demographic, and the custom features. It's a matter of the fact that both uh, Japan and Italy have been experiencing for a long time the phenomenon of the progressing the aging population, fundamentally due to a couple of major factors. The increase of life expectancy accompanied by a low birth rate. While welcoming the higher life expectancy coming from the spread of a more healthy and wealthy life and favoring the elderly is giving them more opportunities to age gracefully through the introduction of the specific and appropriate social means and initiatives. Our society should also concentrate their efforts in promoting policies which provoke an increase of the birth rates. Only working on the two sides of the phenomenon will be possible to build a sustainable, prosperous, and a happy society. The current pandemic situation we are all experiencing has shown us the importance of the demographic structure of our societies. Senior people who have always played a significant role in making our countries flourishing are in fact the most affected social category 
having paid the highest price and suffer the toughest consequences of their dramatic situations. Furthermore, the pandemic has shown once again how significant our demographic structure is making the economic implications on our public expenditures for healthcare clear. So it is of vital importance to give elderly the appropriate consideration they deserve. Being the two oldest countries in the world, Italy and Japan should share their best practices and cooperate to face the new challenges coming from the common features of aging populations. With regard to Japan, demographics have been shifting for decades and we are entering a sort of super age society in which seniors aged 65 or above account for almost 30% of the population. This is mainly due to having access to a better healthcare, better food, and conducting a healthier life, practicing the sports and taking care of the body. Italy also shares the same tendency, but the phenomenon is nowadays global. This gives a great opportunity for transnational and international cooperation initiatives and common actions. New social, political, and legislative changes are needed to address the decrease in the economic productivity due to the aging labor force and the cost increase in healthcare and pensions. Moreover, countries must start rethinking the means for guaranteeing the elderly a quiet, a quiet retirement and a happy aging, as well as a mental wellness. It should be necessary to involve all people in community and volunteer activities and hobbies so that they can still feel to contribute to society and not being a burden for it. Elderly could be crucial to pass on the younger the traditions and the immaterial cultural heritage of their country, contributing to a precious cross-generational interactions and exchanges with a mutual benefit where elderly can also be educated and trained to the new technologies, keeping their brain active and reactive. With regard to Japan, I'm thinking of calligraphy, flower arrangement, origami, and so on. While thinking of Italy, elderly can pass on local traditions, cuisine and traditional craftsmanship, for example. As cutting edge technology has always been a flagship of our countries, allow me to take one more minute to brief illustrate how Japan is becoming a forerunner in the development of the innovative solutions for aging population, in particular exploiting the IoT technologies. Many Japanese enterprises are developing several innovative and visionary devices and products which can help elderly to age gracefully and safe. I'm thinking about uh, the smart tags inserted in shoes and bags to track dementia patients, often wandering off, or smart fabrics, which can monitor many biometric information or detect the symptoms of heart strokes. Also, the artificial intelligence and the virtual reality technologies where Japan is cutting edge too, are demonstrating to be very useful in revolutionizing the care of the old people, helping them to live more independently and autonomously and so happier. Sharing the similar demographic structure, Italy and Japan can work together exchanging their best practices to create an innovative and cutting edge system of care for the elderly, taking into account both the social and the practical aspects of the common phenomenon of the aging populations. Now I will give the floor to others for their interesting and, and speeches from which I'm sure I will learn much. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Minister Hirota. So I will give the floor to Professoressa Corrao, who will help us. Uh, she's, of course, 
a scholar in Middle Eastern studies and culture, but she's also from the ETHOS board. And thank you, Professor Vesa Corral. Good morning, everybody. Ohayo gozaimasu. I'm very honored to be with you uh, this morning. And uh, thank everybody uh, for very interesting speech uh, that you're going to present today. Uh, I won't take uh, time because uh, we have little time and very interesting uh, papers are going to be presented. I would like to introduce Professor Giancarlo Blangiardo, who is president, has been president of the ISTAT, that is the Ita Italian National Institute of Statistics, and he has been teaching statistics at the University of Milano Bicocca. Uh, he was the president of the ISTAT Commission on uh, uh, Technical and Medicological Aspects and uh, population census uh, in uh, 1999, 2002. And he has always member, has been member of the committee for estimation of absolute poverty from 2006, 2007. It has been also part of the instead commission on the measurement of well-being uh, beyond GDP for 2011-2016 and for the definition of elect electoral constituencies in 2015. He is the author of more than 250 papers on scientific journals. So I give uh, uh, the floor to Professor uh, Blangiardo and I remember him that you have only 15 minutes uh, for your speech and um, we'll be listening to uh, an interesting presentation on the uh, actual demographic situation in Italy. Please, the floor is yours. L'audio, professore. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thanks for your, your kind uh, invitation. And uh, I would like to to present, to, sh to show you some uh, um, uh, the, the issues as regarding the, the Italian demographic uh, situation that you can see is uh, quite similar to the Japanese one. I have to share some, some slides, voila. I hope you, you see. Yes, can you see? Can you hear me? Hello? Si, sì, professore, la ah, sentiamo, okay, sorry. Sorry, sorry. sorry, sorry. Well, um, I will start uh, with uh, some uh, um, similarities between Italy and Japan in the last decades. So this year you see the demographic changes uh, in Italy before COVID-19. So uh, fall in births, you see, this is the births, these are the deaths, this is the total population, this is the scale corresponding. You see the fall in the births, a negative natural balance from this period we have a balance that is uh, null. Since uh, uh, 2008, uh, 18, sorry, uh, no, 2008, uh, the, the, the difference is very, very big. And the, the last uh, um, statistics before COVID in uh, 2019, you see that the natural uh, balance is uh, uh, 214 units uh, death more than births. This is the situation in Italy. And of course, also the population, the population growth uh, ended in the, uh, 2015. And from uh, this data, 2015, we lost uh, almost uh, uh, half a million of habitants. Long life uh, situation. You see that uh, from the uh, end of the last World War, there was a gain of near, uh, nearly 15 uh, years of the uh, life expectancy at birth, and uh, half of them, 
of this game was uh, referred to people at 65. As a consequence, uh, we had also an increase uh, of uh, the uh, aging. We are an aging society and the percentage of people over 65 uh, grow from uh, six, 7% in, uh, at the end of the last uh, World War to 23, 24% nowadays. You see also that the very old people, people over 90, uh, had an increase very, very, very important. Now they are almost one and a half percent of the total population. If we compare Italy and, uh, and Japan, we see also uh, the similarity as regard uh, uh, distribution, age distribution, sex and age distribution, according to uh, the baby boomer uh, effect. Uh, this, there are some differences in, in Japan. We have uh, this one and this one peak in Italy, especially in this period. But anyway, we can say that uh, we now look at the effect of the baby boom in the past in both countries. An interesting comparison, comparison is uh, from the uh, so what is called the demographic asset. What is the demographic asset? Uh, is uh, the uh, possibility to, to look uh, according to the um, uh, distribution of uh, sex and the age of a population, the number of years as a whole that can be expected to survive in the, in the population. So if we uh, see Italy, the Italian population as a whole, as a 2.4 billion of years of life expected. The Japanese population, uh, 4 billion point nine the, of uh, the, the demographic asset, we can say. And there you can see uh, this uh, um, year, these years can be uh, shared from time of education, generally till 20, uh, 20 years, time of work from 20 to, six, to 65, and time of retirement. There, you see that uh, if we compare the time of retirement and time of work, we look in Italy, but in Japan too, that uh, we have the similar ratio. So we are going to a period in the, that in the population, the time that will be spent in retirement will be similar to the time that it will be spent at work. And this, this is a, a very important warning as regard the situation of, for example, welfare. These were the, the uh, similarities, but there are also some differences, especially as regard the effect of pandemics. You see, the last year, 2020, in Italy, we had uh, 746,000 deaths and 404 births. The balance is uh, uh, 342 deaths more than births. And this is a very, very uh, problematic uh, uh, effect that we had in our country as regard COVID. Uh, we, we can say that uh, according uh, to the previous uh, five years, in 2020, we had uh, 247 additional deaths daily and uh, 143 uh, births less daily. In general, we can say that each day of last year, Italy lost uh, nearly one uh, 1,000 people. This was a, a very uh, problematic here as regard uh, the, the effect of COVID in, in, uh, uh, as a consequence of pandemic on demography. Uh, indicator by, of course, so the total fertility rate uh, uh, is estimated the, the, the less one in the history of Italy we uh, guess that uh, it will be 1.12 children per woman. 
And also we had, a, we, we, we estimate a change as regard the life expectancy. Uh, in the past, uh, life expectancy had uh, generally uh, every year an increase, but in 2020, we expect to have a life expectancy reduction. And uh, uh, at national level, nearly one year we lost, but if we go in uh, some areas like Lombardy, uh, some other Italian regions, you see that the loss will be also more, more higher. Another um, effect was the reduction of uh, weddings. Uh, almost 50% uh, uh, of, of wedding we lost. And we have to consider that in Italy, uh, births are often in uh, married people. And so, of course, if we had less married people, we have, we have a, a reduction of wedding, we expect uh, to have also a consequence as regard uh, birth in next years. At last, the effect of, uh, on um, aging, well, we see that uh, the effect of COVID, uh, we can estimate, we can guess that the effect of COVID on uh, uh, the aging of population in general, uh, it doesn't stop the aging, but uh, it will reduce the, the, the increase, of course. In some areas, like the Lombardy region, we had really an effect of uh, uh, stop also um, a change in the dynamic of, of, uh, um, of uh, aging in the, in the population. So we are seeing uh, Italy and Japan have uh, some similarities Italy had uh, some differences uh, because in our country, I guess that the, the effect, uh, the demographic effect uh, due to COVID would be higher than, than uh, for example, in, in Japan. And so we are trying to manage uh, the new course, especially as the guard births also in 2021, because uh, surely uh, we, we shall have uh, further effects uh, as regard the, the, the pandemic. Thank you very much for your attention, please. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Brangiardo, for his very clear and updated uh, uh, presentation. Uh, of course, it is uh, sad uh, news that we receive from you, but still we are on the situation that we must act. Uh, in order to change this uh, um, this um, situation, so I am uh, pleased to give uh, the floor now to Professor Ryuichi Tanaka, who is professor of economics uh, at the Institute of so Social Science at the University of Tokyo. He is currently also a research fellow at the Institute of Labor Economics and deputy editor in chief of Social Science Japan Journal. He previously appointments were associate professor at National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, Tokyo Institute of Technology, and uh, assistant professor at Osaka University. He earned uh, his PhD in economics from New York University, and his main focus uh, in research is on education economics, labor economics, and his research has been published in leading academic journals, such as Journal of Public Economics and Labor Economics. Uh, I am uh, I'm pleased and honored to introduce him, and, uh, and, and I want to remember that in Japan has an inspiring attention to the elder, and has a very important care for the young generation and, uh, and so attentive to the formation and solid ethical values preparation. So dear professor, I give you the floor. You'll have only 15 minutes and please, that's your. Okay, thank you very much for uh, very kind introductions. Uh, I'm very honored to be invited to this wonderful conference. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to talk about uh, demographics of Japan. Um, OK, uh, let me share my slide.
OK. Uh, can you see me? Uh, can you see the slide? OK, great. OK, uh, yeah, so I skipped this. All right. Um, OK, uh, so as you know, the Japan is an East Asian country, of course, uh, with a population of the uh, 125 million uh, as of the October 1st of 2020. And at the end of the World War II in 1945, uh, the Japan was populated with uh, 72 million people. And since then, the total population kept growing uh, and the Japan population, Japanese population hit the, the maximum of the 1 million 28, uh, uh, one, no, sorry, the 128 million in 2008. And now the Japanese population is declining. So the blue line of this figure one plots the time series of the uh, total populations of Japan, uh, including the, the forecast uh, to the uh, 2050. Okay. So as you see uh, from this figure, uh, Japan is already you know, in the face of the declining population uh, and uh, it is expected uh, to continue this declining trend. And uh, the orange line uh, here is the Italy one. And uh, so it's a rough estimate, but uh, uh, the, the OECD estimated uh, the forecast, the known population growth in Italy here. Okay, so, um, so the now Japanese population is declining a lot. Uh, the question is, uh, is this declining trend problem? And I would argue that the population uh, decline itself uh, is not necessarily a problem, uh, but a rapid change of the population structure can be a, a problem. The rapid change of the age structure of a population is highly problematic because it makes it difficult to transform uh, the social structures and infra uh, institutions to accommodate these demographic changes. So the Japan's biggest demographic challenge is in this aspect of rapid changes of population structure due to the low fertility and population aging. Okay. So, so as uh, the, the professor, uh, uh, the branch, branch Alto has already pointed out the similarity uh, of the demographics of Japan and Italy, so this figure two who plots the uh, total fertility rate of Japan and Italy. Uh, the blue one is for Japan and the orange line is for or Italy. Uh, from 1950 to 2100. Uh, and as uh, you can see from this figure, the both Japan, uh, the first of all, the Japanese fat, the total fertility rate uh, is uh, quite low, uh, which is lower than uh, the two. Uh, the number needed to replace the populations. And this low fertility rate is one of the reasons of recent population declining in Japan, obviously. But interesting point is that this low fertility rate uh, actually started about five decades ago, uh, but it was considered as a serious problem in 1990 when the Japanese total fertility rate hit the 1.57. And the trend of low fertility causes a low youth dependency ratio and more importantly, a high old dependency ratio in Japan, as we will see later. So oh, these numbers, so I showed some, uh, the numbers of total fertility rate in the past and some focus in the future, but these numbers are actually uh, the old numbers uh, in the sense that the, these numbers do not reflect the influence of the COVID-19. Um, uh, it is reported uh, by the Ministry of Labor uh, of Japan uh, that the number of reported pregnancies uh, from January to October in 2020 was 5.1% uh, lower than the previous year's uh, reported pregnancies. And the actual childbirth rate, uh, the, num uh, the actual number of the newly born in 2020 was uh, about 2% lower. So the COVID-19 affected the, the fertility uh, of Japan, uh, at least in the short run. 
but we will expect the, the more decline and uh, uh, much smaller numbers of the newborns in this year. Okay. And interestingly, the Italy, the Italy experienced a similar decline of the total fertility rate in the past. And the current level of the TFR in Italy is as low as in Japan. So these numbers actually brings a concern of you uh, in Italy to have high old dependency ratio, uh, as the professor already pointed out, uh, even without a population growth uh, in near future. So the figure four uh, plots the, uh, the youth dependency ratio, uh, which is a measure of the number of dependency age, uh, zero, uh, uh, dependent, uh, dependents aged zero to 14, and uh, the compared with the total population aged uh, 15 to 64. So the blue line is again for Japan and the orange line is for Italy. And it is not surprising that the Japan's youth dependency rate is low with low fertility as I have already shown. And the more important is the, uh, the old age dependency ratio. So the biggest demographic challenge of Japan is its high old dependency ratio, uh, rapidly growing currently and in the future. So this figure five uh, shows the, uh, the old age dependency ratio uh, reported by the OECD, uh, which is a ratio of the population of over the age of 65 uh, to the total population aged 15 to 64. So as you can see from this figure, the Japanese old age dependency ratio is high and growing rapidly. And this is one of the biggest concerns questioning the sustainability of social uh, security and infrastructure such as public pensions and uh, the national health insurance system. And by looking at the orange line uh, for Italy, uh, as you can see too, the Italy is actually the following the, and uh, the catching up uh, with the Japanese trend. So the high old, the old age dependency ratio can be a serious concern in Italy too. Right, so, uh, so what is a possible impact on the economy? So there are many ways uh, to affect the economy through the uh, declining population, uh, but I would like to focus on the labor shortage, a labor force shortage. So apparently the Japan will face severe labor force shortage to maintain the current level of economic activities, uh, as well as the social security system in near future. And actually the cabinet office uh, of Japan released its forecast about the labor force based on the population forecast in a report published in the 2014 and uh, several scenarios. And even in the most optimistic scenario uh, with the uh, recovery of fertility rate to the replacement level and 90% of the labor force participation of the female in age from uh, 29, uh, uh, hold on, uh, 29 to uh, no, 30 to 49 as in Sweden, and the increase of the labor force participation of the old age uh, by five years more uh, staying in the labor market, then the labor force declines at 0.4% annually. In other words, uh, the total labor force uh, declines from the uh, 65 million to the 55 million in 2016. And in the, worst, in the worst scenario, uh, without any of these three uh, good aspects to maintain the population, the labor force decline actually a lot uh, to the uh, 38 million in 2016, uh, which is a decline of the more than 1% labor force annually. So, so what can we do uh, to mitigate uh, the impacts? And to avoid the worst scenario, the Japanese government uh, seeks uh, effective policy measures to mitigate them. And the first set of the policies is of course the pronatal policies to boost uh, the fertility by reducing the child rearing cost uh, since 1990. 
And we have uh, uh, set up the, uh, uh, the policy plans uh, starting from 1994, uh, which is called the Angel Plan. And the next one is the New Angel Plan. And uh, the, the third one is called the Child Bearing, the Child Rearing Support Plan, or the, some people call the New New Angel Plan. And under these support plans, the government tried mainly to increase the supply of the childcare facilities through the subsidizing schemes. However, um, uh, as we have already known, uh, these plans uh, did not reverse. Uh, I'm not saying these are not if in, uh, these are if were ineffective, but uh, the, uh, these plans did not at least reverse the trend of the declining fertility, as we have already seen in the figure one. So, so another set uh, of the policies aimed to increase the female labor force participation. So the Japanese government tried, uh, tries to implement policies to improve the work-life balance, uh, enhancing the participation of mothers in labor markets and the fathers in child rearing. And with the child rearing support plan, so these regulations and the supportive uh, measures are ex expected to increase the female labor force participation. In fact, uh, the female labor force participation rate increased uh, substantially in the last two decades. For example, the labor force participation rate for the female aged from 25 uh, to 44 was uh, the 57% in 1986. And it is now uh, about the, the 78% in 2019. So, uh, okay. And another policy measure, uh, well, another policy target is to increase the old labor force participation. So in Japan, the mandatory retirement age was 60 uh, before 2000, uh, but now it is 65 in large firms. And this is a response uh, to an increase of the eligible age to receive the public pension, starting age of the public pension receipt. Uh, and actually that uh, starting age was raised from 60 to 65. And as a response to this change of the, the policy of the public pension, the, now the mandatory retirement age was also raised. And also the average retirement age in Japan is actually high uh, and the higher than the other uh, OECD countries. And uh, it is higher uh, in particular than in Italy. And it is reported that it is reported by the OECD that the male retirement age was about 70 years old in Japan. Uh, and uh, on average, the, the, the 61 years old in Italy in 2007. The number is a bit old, but uh, uh, the difference is quite uh, substantial, I would say. But uh, even with high, the late retirement in Japanese old population, uh, provided that the long uh, longevity of the Japanese population and the long life expectancy of the Japanese population the increase of the labor force participation of old population is considered uh, as one of the most important policy measures to mitigate the negative effect of uh, the high old age dependency rate. And another apparent option is uh, international migration. And uh, uh, in the world, in particular, in the context of the global context. However, uh, in Japan, in Japanese, context that it is not pursued uh, with a historically very restrictive immigration policy. However, in reality, we see many you know, foreign workers uh, working in the industries facing the several labor, a severe labor force shortage, such as agriculture, uh, constructions, and service sectors. So uh, I would say that the serious discussion on the how to form uh, the immigration policy uh, in reality is, is uh, quite important for the Japan, Japanese economy. And other relevant policy might be included in the, the improvement of the labor productivity through the ICT and artificial intelligence technologies or the recurrent education uh, to improve the labor productivity of the middle-aged people. 
Well, another uh, policy is to increase the labor force of the people with the disabilities or the improve the labor market attachment of the youth out of the labor markets. And also the increased investment uh, to, in to increase the investment, financial liberalization or the encouragement of the domestic investment uh, are also considered as the policy measures to mitigate the negative effect on the economy. And in implementing these policies, the, the role of the local governments are quite uh, important. Okay, uh, so the Japan is already in the phase of the population decline and looking at the flow variables such as a fertility, Italy may follow the trend like Japanese one. And to mitigate the serious effects of the population decline, the general lesson is that the sooner the better to take measures to mitigate fertility decline. So when it starts declining, uh, it is quite difficult to intervene fertility because everything is so related in a very, very complicated way. And the Japanese experience and its evaluation of these policies uh, uh, mitigating the effects provide a guide for or Italy to form demographic policies. And finally, the, from the Japanese point of view, uh, I am very interested in the, uh, how the Italian immigration policy affected the demographic trend. Okay, thank you very much for listening, and I will appreciate any question comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ruichi Tanaka. And now uh, I must introduce uh, Professor Roberto Bernabe, Professor of International Medicine and Geriatrics at the Catholic University of uh, the Sacred Heart in Rome. He's also director of the School of Specialization in Geriatrics at the same university. In the past, he has been president of the Italian Society of Gerontology and Geriatrics and a member of European Academy for Medicine of Aging. Last February, Professor Bernabe was appointed Pope Francis personal physician. So I am... Uh, Please, uh, to give him the floor, reminding that he has only 15 minutes and uh, hoping for the future that uh, we will improve women's working condition and increase in public sphere attention for the care of the elder. But now the world is yours, dear Professor Benabe. Thank you and good morning to all and good evening uh, possibly to, to Professor Tanaka. Uh, from what you suggested, uh, it looks like we should say that we have to increase the immigrant percentage and we have to not retire from work uh, as possible solutions to the uh, birth crisis and the elderly increase, which could be very, very uh, critical and uh, a problem if we would say loudly uh, that this is the solution. But for sure, being and having so many elderly has an impact on health. Uh, having an elderly population simply means to have more diseases, more frail people, and what worries me, more disability. In general, we think that uh, uh, the forecast is by age 2030, we will have in our country something about 50 million of disabled people, mostly elderly, and five, six million of them are fully disabled. People that need a 24 hour assistance per day. So this is a, a, one of the probably big challenges because we have to reorganize our health system. And the pandemia was extremely uh, helpful in some way because it, opens, it opened our eyes in front of uh, what's going on and uh, what mean to have an elderly country. Uh, let's go straight to the slide and uh, This is the mean median age of diagnosis for the pandemic in this country, which is around 47 years, 
while the median age of dead people is 83, with a striking performance with respect to mean age of dead people from the first week in February to the latest number, first week of March, you see that the histogram is absolutely flat. Mean age, 81. Mean age, 81. And this is the consequence of having an elderly country. The impact of anything that disturbs, that creates problem to frail people creates death. We had the same issue in the year 2003, when we had the heat wave. In 2003, we had a, an absolute increase in mortality and the increase in mortality was incumbent was for the same category of people. People with 81 years old of age, mean age, and with the same comorbidities that we are going to see soon. So, first consequence of an elderly country is that you need to be very aware that anything that can disturb frail people will hit and will make them die. If you look at this slide, you also note that 90% of death were related from for the population over 70. Only 10% of people less than 70 were dying because of COVID. But uh, it's quite uh, interesting to know that we had uh, 1,500, uh, 1, excuse me, 1,050 out of the 96,000 deaths by 1st of March that had less than 50 years old. And we had 2,054 dead people with less than 40 years old. But only 36 of those 254 had no relevant diseases. Just to say that another component of this death is the comorbidities. You see that we had around 62% in the first wave, 76% in the second wave, and 74% in the third wave of people with three or more diseases. So the other characteristic is that we have an elderly population. This elderly population is frail and uh, is very able and capable to die. And third thing, this population has comorbidities. So the comorbidities, comorbidities have an effect on the death rate. Which are the most, most frequent conditions? The more frequent diseases you may see here, and hypertension, ischemic heart disease, atrial fibrillation, diabetes, dementia, and uh, chronic kidney diseases are extremely frequent. So remember that this is the synthesis that the number of diseases, it's an important component. And it's an important component because we are accustomed to know each patient disease per disease, not as a kind of unique entity made up of various diseases. So we have to switch our mind and think to our patients as a, a complex kind of people with a lot of diseases that make a unique new nosological entity. So medicine has to change, but all the society in some way has to change. And we are slow in this process. We are very slow 
because probably it was a very rapid, a very speed process. And even in other part of society, there are, there are no reactions to the graying of the society. I'm impressed by a tuna can. Tuna can is almost impossible to be opened by an old people, old person over 80 with arthritis. And nobody thought to make a simple can, which could be easy to be sold and could create money and give money to the producer. So even the entrepreneur people are not rapid in dealing with the, the grain in the world. The same in the supermarket, the large distribution, the shelves are too high for short people. And as you know, people getting older, they become shorter and shorter. But think also to this one, it's one of the most important products sold around the world as a kind of comfort food. Look at the small, uh, the small quantity has a very easy opener. So it's not difficult to be open while the, the big can, the big, the big, uh, the big uh, bottle, one kilogram, it's uh, almost impossible to be open. And the, behind this, this product, there are a lot of bright people, a lot of intelligence that do not think that the world is growing, so need to be rethink, rethought. And I want to end up with the, the most dramatic uh, uh, and contradictory product that I saw in, in, a, in, in a drug uh, in, a, in a pharmacy, it's a, a, a something that helps the elderly to get out of the chair. And look how is ugly. I wouldn't never give to my parents, to my older parents, because they would be really feel ashamed, insulted by such a product. And we, Italy, is the country where you have a furniture company every mile and you have the best designer in the world. Could it be possible to design a nice chair to be sold around the old world? So I think that these are the challenges that uh, our country in Japan should deal immediately and uh, use the elderly that we have as a kind of natural laboratory to produce a different health system and a lot of nice manufacts that could be sold all over the world and make life easier for everybody and for the elderly in particular. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Bernabe. Very interesting and uh, attentive presentation. Uh, now I give uh, the floor to uh, um, Marco Valerio Loprete for the roundtable discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Professoressa Corrao. Thank you. And now we move on to the second part of the seminar, what we call the roundtable discussion. So with few shorter interventions from academics and experts. And as we said, uh, rebalancing our demographics for a sustainable growth can be hard, as Professor Blangiardo and Professor Tanaka told us, but uh, we need to make no mistake, such a rebalancing will be impossible if we do not start at least to talk about it and to plan for it. And that's why uh, Professor Bernabe was really interesting when he said that entrepreneurship also has a role a new thinking is needed. And that's why um, I'm even glad that Louis University, that's a university, of course, linked to the business community, was ready and eager to host this meeting 
And thanks again to uh, Giovanni Lostorto for this. So we will start with this round table with Professor <clears throat> Antonio Golini, Professor Emeritus at Sapienza University, demographer of course, in just two words, in 1968, uh, demographics became popular around the world, uh, all over the planet, when Paul Ehrlich wrote the book, The Population Bomb, uh, in which a word of a global famine due to a rising population. And Professor Golini at the time, I would say in the 70s, looking at the numbers, was among the first ones in Italy and in Europe to argue the opposite, that Europe, and maybe Japan too, needed to worry about a population bust and not a population boom. Uh, so now the pandemic, as Professor Blanjardo told us, is spinning up this process of stabilization and in some cases decline of population. So now let me give the floor to Professor Golini uh, for his uh, seven, eight minutes speech. Professor, it's uh, up to you. You need to uh, take your audio on, put your audio on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this seminar. Thank you above all for having chosen to address the issue of demography from an international comparative perspective and for having chosen Japan as a term of comparison for our country. Uh, Italy, Japan, it is already been said, have a common the fact that they, they are the two oldest countries on the planet. Uh, this is a, an historical success that uh, I am pleased with and uh, personally take advantage of. Above all, however, a comparison between these two countries allows us to better understand how we got to where we are today, which common challenges we face, and from which possible solutions we could draw some inspiration. So, how did we get here? Italy and Japan have marching together for decades on this front. I participated for years as a representative of Italian government in a United Nations meeting on populations. When this issue was still rightly at the top of UN agenda. Joseph Pechami, who was a former director of the UN Population Division, now is a famous demographer, has written a book entitled The Historical Reversal. The historical reversal is the demographic turning point when children in a population become fewer than its elderly. This historical reversal in, uh, in the world first happened in Italy in 1995. Five years later, it happened in six additional countries and Japan was one of them. Therefore, Italy and Japan are at the forefront of a contemporary aging transformation. These demographic transformations happened in the last decades and they are happening again uh, nowadays with the shrinking of, this, of the labor force in these two countries. In, uh, in Italy, there is a lot of talk about demographic emergency. 
And uh, I have uh, written also in my last book with Marco Valerio Lopete, I rather talking about demographic malaise. In fact, uh, there is uh, nothing new in what we are witnessing. We have had a huge demographic crisis occurring for the last 20, 30 years now. Uh, there is uh, just uh, one example of this long-term effect on our workforce. In Italy, in 1980, there was 17 million people under 20, 20 years old and 10 million people over years old. 35 years later, in 2015, the ratio has been exactly reversed. We have only 10 million people under 20 and 17 million people over 60 years old. The impact of the, on the youth workforce is impressive. In 1998, there was 7.6 million employed people with an age between 15 and 34 years old. Today, there are 5 million young workers out of 12.5 million young people. There were, above all, as a result of a low birth rate in 20 years, we have lost one young person employment out of the three. Again, the similarities with Japan are striking. Japan's working age population has been in decline since 1990. And according to the World Forum forecast, Italy and Japan are the, the two countries, along with South Korea, with, uh, who will lose the biggest chunk of their working age population in the next 25 years. Uh, there is one last striking similarity which I would like to highlight at this point. Both Japan and Italy have a very high public debts and low birth rates. Correlation is not causation, as the scientists say, but I have the impression that the people on the street, although they are not economists, and they can still sense that Italy's and Japan large public debts mean that we will less money in the coming years and a more difficult future for their children. Now, let, uh, let's see a few interesting differences among us. First of all, the Japanese society chose to turn demographics into a national debate, into a national priority for its policy. And um, as Mr. Lotorto said at the beginning, the debates on demographics are always being present in contemporary Japan, at least at the policy level. In Italy, it has been the opposite. Back in the 1970s, I was among the first scholars in Italy to suggest that our country and our clear continent did not have a fear 
a population explosion, but more likely a population implosion due to a rapidly lowering fertility. Silence, silence was the most common reply I would get, especially from a non-expert. Sometimes I was even attacked for raising an issue that was out of touch with the mainstream debates about overpopulation. This state of affairs has lasted for many years. Nowadays, out of the blues, everybody in Italy talks about demographic crisis. This long absence of a public debate, demographic policies of any kind lagged behind. Quite the opposite, in the last decade, Japan has deployed public policies that can be an inspiration for Italy. For the sake of synthesis, I will just mention a few of them. First of all, the rethinking of health care for old people. Second, technological innovation to accompany the aging of a population and of workforce in particular. The third, the so-called women economics to bridge the gap in employment and wages between men and women. Four, sexual aid for the birth rate. Five, and finally, a policy of a highly qualified immigration. This short historical background has at least two methodological lessons for us. Faster, we better talk about demographics and its impact if we want to address its consequences. Second, the Japanese experience sounds as like a warning. When dealing with demographics, there is no easy and immediate solution. Let me finish with a quick reference to an ethical issue that is closely linked to demographics. The issue of intergenerational justice. In Italy, recently, there has been a lot of talking about the lowering the voting age from 18 years old to 16 years old. I would argue that choosing demographic equilibrium as a national priority would be much more useful for young people than changing the voting age. John Rawls, one of the most important philosophers of the last century, once wrote that in a fair and just society, the present generation is bound to respect the claims of its successors. Its generation must not only preserve the acquisition of culture and civilization and keep intact uh, the just institution already in existence, but must also set aside in each period of time an appropriate amount of real capital. This saving may take various, various forms from net investment in machinery and other means of production to investments in learning and education. Ralph's intuition and gave rise to call 
for international sustainability, which is the basis of the famous Brutland report of 1987, containing the world's widespread definition of environmental sustainability. That is, sustainable development is development that allows to present the generation to meet with the all needs without compromising the ability of a future generation to meet their own needs. Let me finish noting that the Japanese constitution is among the few parts in the world that actually refer to interests of future generations. It's one of the few world constitutions which explicitly grants future generation same rights that are granted to present people. Again, this is a fair and useful cultural approach we, as Italian, um, as Italians in the middle of a demographic East, is a cultural approach we might learn from. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Golini. You also mentioned John Rawls, uh, so one of the thinkers uh, who Professor Maffettone helped disseminate in Italy, so he would be happy to hear that. Now, um, our next speaker is Maria Rita Testa, professor of demographics at Lewis University. She's an eminent scholar, and uh, I have to say she also strikes me for her attitude and point of view on the topic. Uh, last night, she was on the Italian public television, Rai, uh, talking about the seminar, and she dared to say the word optimism associated to the word demographics, something quite pe peculiar. So this is one more reason I invite you to listen to Professor Maria Testa, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for having me uh, today to share with you some thoughts on demographic challenges of Italy and Japan. I will talk about one specific challenge uh, of these two countries that share a very long period of very low fertility, uh, almost five decades of very low fertility, below 1.5 children per woman, and have in common also a continuous increase in the life expectancy that is today above 80, 84 for Japan and 83 for Italy. And they have seen these driving forces have caused a tremendous change in the age structure of the population. We have gone from a situation in the 1950 where there were many people uh, be between uh, uh, age zero and 15 to a situation uh, prospectively in 2050 where there will be many people in the Japanese population above age 65 or more than 30%. The same reversal in the shape of the age pyramid has been observed in the Italian uh, population. And this has been paralleled by a change in the ratio between working age people and old age dependent person. In parallel, we are going to see that in the, it is already started for Japan, a population decline. So why is a challenge this aging and declining um, projected path of these two countries? I'm not going to talk about the, the rooms we would have to face the challenge on the side of migration and healthy life. Instead, I will concentrate on children today. I want to start from the consideration that there is a pretty much a correspondence between individuals target and societal targets. So individuals who want to enter partnership, 
help children and surveys show that the most likely option is a two child family and they want to have a career in the work in the labor market and in the family and care spend their leisure time with family members not only old but also young. And on the side of governments, uh, uh, they are also uh, very uh, attentive to children if they even entitle a new program of recovery plan in Europe next generation. And they are also very concerned about well-being of people as we can see in the uh, 2030 development goal agenda. So where is the challenge? The challenge is in the fact that the very low fertility does not reflect very low family size preferences in the two countries. We see here the completed fertility of women born in 1967 and both Japan and Italy are pretty much at the top of these country rankings. Uh, Japan, in Japan, women ended their reproductive career with 1.42 children. And in Italy, they ended their career with 1.43 children. But instead, these women who wanted had as a target 2.1 children in Italy and 2.2 children in Japan. A similar uh, picture we can gain if we look at the share of childlessness. We see that both countries, Japan and Italy, at, are pretty much at the top of the country rankings in the share of childlessness. In Japan, women born in 1972 completed their childbearing career with, without children in uh, with a share of 28.2%. Uh, and in Italy, the share was just a bit below 20.9%. Again, this is not reflected in the intended childlessness that was reported in the share of just 5 to 10% in both countries. So why people end up their career without children or with fewer children than intended. We know there are um, several reasons and the economic ones are related with the cost of children, direct and indirect cost related to house, education, childcare. And there are also some structural reasons related to the strong care obligation the unequal division of childcare tasks between men and women within the couple, and the diffusion of a work culture not very conducive to a work-life balance. So in the end, the explanation are wrap up in the existence persistent of patriarchal society in Japan and the persistent of a very strong familistic society in Italy. And these have been um, grouped, these reasons behind the very low fertility under the umbrella of uncertainty as a lack of control on a long-term vision of life. I have heard sociologists in Italy talking about society with low battery. And it, is, uh, it has been declined, this uncertainty, in different dimensions, employment, reproductive, and especially after the widespread of COVID pandemic, also related to the health and life. So how to close the gap between intended and actual family size in the two countries? We know we have several options and we can act on the demand for children, reducing the cost with provision of service, increasing the income with cash benefits or supporting the decision of young couples to have a first or another child with bonus 
or parental leave. But I want to draw your attention on the fact that, uh, on the experience of Japan, as Professor Tanaka has rightly said, that we can look at Japan uh, as a, an example uh, to, to follow uh, what did happen in Japan? There was a very gender equal measure in terms of parental leave, which allowed fathers to take a share in the total leave up to 45% of full rate equivalent weeks in the total parental leave. You see the Japan is at the record in the area of OECD countries in these measure, while we are lying in the other opposite of this graph with a share of below 5%. Why this very progressive measure has been not accompanied by any increase of fertility? Well, the reason is very simple. Only 5% of father did take up the leave. And when they were asked to report the reason why didn't they take the leave, you see at the top of this uh, uh, graph, the most common reason are my company did not offer it, or there was simply an unfavorable atmosphere against taking leave. So this is to say that when we Think about a, a policy uh, to support fertility. We should not forget that there are important cultural factors behind uh, low fertility and that young couples have different uh, aspirations, are changing their expectation and aspiration. They want to enjoy life and have expensive leisure time, expensive travel, expensive food instead of having children. And in the case of Japan, there is also, this situation is also more pronounced because of the persistence of very high family obligation. So the key open issue in the challenge for Japan that has done a pretty good job on the side of female labor force participation that has indeed increased is to have more attention on changes in family attitude because so far there has been an absence of major change on this respect. In the case of Italy where we just start to think about addressing the demographic challenge, well, the most important open issue is to promote the kind of optimism for the young generation. So multiply the, opportunity, the job opportunities and promote the early transition to adulthood of women and more generally young adults. So it is clear that uh, for both countries, Japan and Italy, we cannot expect a, a return to higher fertility and close the gap with just one policy, be it family allowance or early childcare. But we need a thoroughgoing institutional realignment that close the gap between desire or intended and actual number of children. And also when we think about this realignment, we have to think about acting acting in a, a very um, accurate, careful way to see what could be the response of the society when a given policy measure is implementing, implemented. I think it's a challenge or what to be faced because in the end, the children are really the core of a society and each society gets in the end the children it deserves. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to Professor Testa. And um, now we go uh, to the next speaker because The Economist uh, this week uh, hosted an interesting column about falling demographics. So the issue we've been talking about. And in the article, The Economist, so the, the, the most important weekly magazine in the world, um, basically says, and I'm quoting, Fewer people may also, need, may also mean fewer new ideas, building a very different sort of future 
than optimists tend to imagine. Now, this is the main topic addressed by our next speaker, Professor Alfonso Giordano, who is Professor Lewis of Geopolitics, Population and Sustainability. So I will give the floor to him for seven to eight minutes. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good morning, of new, uh, good evening in Japan. First of all, let me thank the organizers for this uh, webinar dealing with the issues which are vital to the country's future. And thank you, of course, for inviting me, Dr. Mostort and uh, Dr. Loprete. Uh, I've prepared some slides, slides which I'm going to share. Let's see, here we are. Can you see them? Okay. Uh, so the topic I would like to talk about concerns the nexus between population dynamics, economics, and geopolitics, particularly in the case of Italy. Uh, so uh, let's start with, um, let's open this one completely. Okay. Uh, let's start with uh, uh, a postcard of the country which draws a geoeconomic and geodemographic divide. According to the Italian National Institute of Statistics, the population in Italy should reach approximately 59 million in 2045, falling to 44.1 million in 2065. This implies at least 6 million fewer residents than today, a drop of 10%. Southern Italy population in particular will diminish for the whole of the period under consideration, while a progressive decline in central north population will only begin in 2045. Evidently, the economic divide that separates southern Italy from the rest of the country will deteriorate as a result of depopulation and aging, giving also the return of the phenomenon of youth emigration. So uh, here are the number, the structure, the policies. Of course, in the past we dealt mainly with the number, but now we have to deal with the, the structure. The real phenomenon under observation, however, is not diminishing population as a whole, and not the longevity, which is itself is a positive factor, but the increasing lack of young people within the Italian society due to the drop in births. Uh, this has produced an automatically insufficient number of new workers, badly employed in a progressively aging population pyramid, and above all, in the context of increased and increasing welfare and pension spending, which has led to a series of negative results in terms of economic dynamics, innovation, productivity, and geopolitical relevance. In addition, this as must be said, in 20 years between the 70s and the 90s, Italy endured a sequence of public policies that were completely detached from, if not in open contradiction to the demographic reality of the country, and therefore unsustainable from an economic and generational perspective. I will try to graphically demonstrate these trends in the next slide. So here we are with um, this slide that we can observe the age dependency ratio from 1950 to uh, 2020 for Italy and the projection to 2050. These are on visit on the United Nations population division, the 2019 uh, revision. Uh, we know, as Professor Konakana just explained, that the age dependency ratio is the sum of the young population under age of 15 and the elder population aged 65 and over relative to the working age population age 15 to 64. So what, can, what we can guess from this figure? The first issues is that the Italian age dependency ratio, as you can see, grow at the beginning of the new century and will increase more and more starting from 2030. This naturally to the increase, now we know this, in the share of the elderly. <clears throat> the second issues concern the Italian miracle. Uh, you know, this economic miracle, of course, we had and take place between the 50 and 60 of the last century. The interesting thing is that unlike many other countries, Italy had this economic lap, not during its demographic window of opportunity, but before. We know that this way was not only due to internal factors, we had high productivity, low trade union activity, a sufficient number of workers and so on, but also to external factors, such as the geopolitical importance of Italy in those years as a border country with the communist world, and therefore the America interest with the Marshall Fund. But the third interesting thing is about the demographic window of opportunity. Uh, we know that the demographic window of opportunity is an historical moment uh, in which the working age population is very consistent compared to the inactive population, such as children and elderly. 
We must remember that demographic window appeared in for Western countries in the second half of the last century, a period that historians call the glorious 30. And in this period, we currently at their most impressive economic prosperity. We can understand that the demographic window is now open for the Asian countries or most of them. Italy experienced this demographic window between the 70s and 90s. Just when its dependency, you can see here with the line, uh, independence rate was the lowest, meaning we had a lot of active population in comparison with the decline of the fertility rate and the still low share of elderly people. And this would be what? What would be the, the perfect time to consolidate the economic success achieved between the 50 and the 60? But instead of first enhancing the well being achieved in the 60, by exploiting the demographic window to invest in the future and the family policies, Italy has settled a certain level of comfort zone, comfort area. So leaving room more than elsewhere, more than in other countries for a socioeconomic model dominated by aging population, the effect of the um, baby boomers uh, born between 40 and 60 of the last century, which favored short-term economic policy solution without the innovation looking too short, in particular, an um, unsustainable pension system that ended up evilly affecting the public debt, we know this. And this was a detriment of investment for the future. And so we pass from a country, part of G7, and one of the first industrial power of the end of the last century to a country that has been going through several crises uh, at the end of, of the last century, and particularly in the beginning of this new center. Over the last 30 years, Italy has recorded one of the worst economic performances among Western countries in terms of per capita GDP, productivity, technology, employment, territorial, social, and generational and gender disparity. But this was balanced completely and perfectly with one of the most marked processes of demographic decline in the world as Japan. The Japan in Italy has similar stories in this. The Japan, the strongest Japan was in the 80s uh, with the demographic window just open. So this negative evolution began when the demographic window closed exactly 30 years ago during the 90s. In future decades, Italy will have to take a demographic scenario that will impact more negatively than other countries in, on its economic growth and of course, in, not, in its geopolitical relevance. So, uh, in other words, we need to link strongly the economy, geopolitical choices with demography to have sustainable futures. So in other words, uh, we are to witness a shrinking population equipped with a diminishing workforce. That means, of course, negative economic and productive repercussion, repercussions an increasing number of elderly people and a decreasing number of young people, all occasionally employment, with the most talented young often leaving the country. And this means, of course, an impoverishment of innovative human capital. Any kind, and this was just pointed out by uh, Maria Testa, any kind of recovery in fertility, however robust, will not change the overall short term scenario. This is partly due to the long-term effect of demography, but above all, because the structural aging uh, of the Italian population means that the number of fertile women today is half that of the women in that 50 was fertile period is coming to an end now. We have few fertile women. Furthermore, the impoverishment of the fertile potential come alongside a stagnant economic scenario that could be further penalized by COVID-19 pandemic, as Professor Blagiardo already noted. So just to go to the conclusions, in order to mitigate the negative economic consequences of an aging population and to compensate the trend in reduction of the workforce, some policy options, these are just some few, uh, can be evaluated in the case of Italy specifically. I will not spend so much words on this since Maria Testa already told us. Uh, that means the prolongation of working life. This is obvious. Of course, we have to do it and we are doing this. An increase in family participation in the job market. This is the key point, right? the completely key point. 
and the improvement of human capital endowment and management of necessary and sustainable immigration flows in context which show renewed and necessary attention directed towards the condition of your generation. And this is on the other key points. So women and young. And it means that uh, as a country that is poor in young people, Italy risks producing an increasingly poor youth gen uh, generation and population. Different data sets demonstrates that in fact, the absolute poverty is more common in young people under the age of 35 than in old people over the age of 65. This is a complete revolution. We have to remind also that the number of old people in Italy superseded the number of young people in the country in 2018. A quantitative reduction should correspond to a qualitative improvement in order to avoid compromising the sustainability of a country's social system and its economic growth. In conclusion, uh, there is a need to uh, look beyond the present in order to give more meaning, future perspective and value to today's individual and collective choices. The relationship that need to improve between demographic variables and economic system is truly urgent. We are doing this in this webinar. Yet lacks popularity with public debates due to the long-term choices it requires, which unfortunately are often undervalued as policy options because of their scarce appeal in the electoral terms. Can we recover? Of course we can. Uh, I am optimistic like, like Maria Testa. Demography is not necessarily destiny, but we must avoid the mistakes of the past. I try to underline. That is not to take in account, in account the population trend in geopolitical and economic policy choices. For example, now with this great opportunity we have with the European funds call it not by chance, next generation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Giordano. And let me thank, before we go to the next speaker, also to uh, again thank um, Giovanni Lo Storto, Director General of Lewis, who's been following the works until now. And now I know he has an. Uh, uh, he has another commitment uh, at this time, but he has been following almost two hours with us. And uh, thanks also because, as we heard from Professor Giordano, Professoressa Testa, uh, Luis has been reflecting even through its academics on demographics and all its implication. Uh, so thank you, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Lostorto, for being with us all this time. Thank and you. Um, thanks. Thank you very much and for the support. Now we go to our last two speakers. Uh, we heard from Professor Giordano that a rapid change in the structure of a population can have negative consequences on growth and innovation in the medium long term, but intensive aging and declining births already are associated to some form of economic disruption, even in the short term. Uh, for example, the scarcity of care workers now, thanks to Dr. Uh, Giulio Corrivetti, we will have a glimpse of some Italian best practices and ongoing projects to cope with this kind of disruption in the field of special care offered to senior citizens. So uh, the, the floor is to Giulio Corrivetti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lo Storto. Thank you, Zovol, uh, for very interesting uh, relations and uh, First of all, I would like to thank Lewis University and the Embassy of Japan in Italy for inviting me to this international seminar. Dr. Marika De Vita, CEO of De Vital, was unable to attend due to an unforeseeable commitment. And she asked me to bring her greeting as well. In a few minutes, I would like to give you an idea of how in Italy, public and private operators are organizing themselves also with innovative solutions to study and manage the phenomenon of aging. The fact that I am connected from Salerno in Campania leads me to two brief promises. The first, it is well known that the diet of countries like Italy and Japan is one of the most important reasons for our longevity. Well, Salerno is the cardinal of the Mediterranean diet, so much studied by Ansel Case, included in uh, 2010 by UNESCO in the list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity. 
This diet is associated, according to several scientific study, studies, to a lower frequency of chronic disease and to a greater longevity. Moreover, here in Sarello, there was the European most ancient institution for medicine. I am talking about the famous Salerno Medical School, founded in the 19th century, uh, 9th century, which became the most important source of medical knowledge in Western Europe in the following centuries. This school was the, still located in an area of the city where it uh, was also a building for religious purposes. The building dating back to 1064, where there was, uh, and is visible today, also archaeological finding of a thermal structure that served precisely to treat the most fragile and oldest of our ancestors. In this building, a similar historical and cultural heritage lives today through the Hebris Foundation, European Biomedical Research Institute of Salerno, of which I am vice president, the foundation chaired by Professor Alessio Fasano of Mass General Hospital, was born with the support of the Harvard Medical School. The files of interest covered are intestinal pathology, oncological pathologies, and neuroscience. In fact, one of the most important protocols underway today is named CDGEM, Genomic, Environmental, Microbiome, and Metabolome Prevention Project, Genetic Predisposition and Exposure to Environmental Stress are two key elements in the development of the autoimmunity. Celiac disease is a unique example to, of um, autoimmunity since it's the only autoimmune disease for which the environmental factor, ingestion of gluten containing cereals, wheat, barley, and rye, is known. A second important research protocol funded by European Commission is for the study of autism, called GEMMA, Genomic Environmental Microbiome Metabolome in Autism. In this case, we studied inflammatory and autoimmune mechanism related to autism spectrum disorders. Both studies are important because they develop delve into the relationship between genetic predisposition and living environment in two massive pathologies. In fact, urbanization processes and lifestyles also influence the use we debate today. Our activities fall within the life science sector because we study issues related to the development and the, the, uh, and the aging of the brain and its functions, with implication for the quality of life of population and the social cost of highly disabling disease. Prevention, lifestyle, di dietary style affect aging. We can limit the onset of some diseases through prevention, and it is therefore very important to train people on the issues of active aging. From this need was born the Active Living Academy, which aims to help people to add years to life and life to years, as we say, promoting a healthy lifestyle. The Active Living Academy is aimed at the school and the companies offering courses and projects aimed at educating on the importance of prevention and active living to avoid the onset of disease relating to aging. With Active Living Academy and Digital Group, that is a partner of Ethos Lewis, and one of the leaders in Italy in the training of doctors, we are also planning in an area near Salerno, a multifunctional center for combined neuroscience research, 
residential and innovative service for the management of well-being and health in the elderly. The goal is to integrate multiple functions and develop new models of residential care that also include physical, recreational, social, and mental activities for an increasingly senior inclusive future. The dream is to have in a few years an innovative complex at the center of the Mediterranean Sea that can be a reference in the field of neuroscience and aging. And why not? That can also accommodate a flow of people interested in active living in those strengthened and the relationship between Italy and Japan. In conclusion, within the project, I have quickly outlined to you public health, private companies, and even educational institutions work together side by side. It's a model we should try to replicate in other parts of Italy. As a matter of fact, in 10 years time, according to report edited by Catholic University of Milan, there will be six, six million elderly people in Italy who will not be self-sufficient. That means that more than one Italian resident out of ten to cope with such an unprecedented situation, unprecedented creativity and efforts are needed. The Japanese case study, the Japanese handling of an aging society can help us move in this direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Corivetti. So he mentioned the importance of the Mediterranean diet for our longevity. And um, there is an important author, Vaclav Simi, a Canadian expert who just wrote a book about and where he talks about the Japanese exceptionality. And basically, he says that Japanese longevity can be explained also by the fact that Japanese people eat according to the rule. Uh, that sounds like hara hachi bun me. Now, oh, sorry for my Japanese, but the Confucian model means people should eat until they're eighty percent full, not hundred percent. So now, having said something about Japanese culture and language, uh, let me give the floor to the best expert on this, uh, Professor Joya Vienna, professor of Japanese language and cult and literature for the University of Foreigners of Siena, and also uh, a member of Ethos. Um, the think tank run by Professor Maffettone. So, Professor Vienna, to, to you, the conclusion in the last seven, eight minutes. Thank you for being with us until thank now. You. And let me thank Professor Giordano, who needs to leave us because he has class now. Thank you. Well, thank you to you. And my thanks are the last one for today, but are warmly formulated. So I'm repeating my thanks, but really it was very interesting and somehow refreshing to restart with this kind of activities after a long time uh, of silence, let's say. Um, let me share the screen for my presentation. Right. I think you should now see the, the slides. Is it okay? Yes. Okay. So um, what we have been discussing today somehow has a, a direct impact on my uh, activity uh, as a uh, teacher of Japanese language and literature. And now we will somehow see how uh, I choose as a title issues of the population challenge between Italy and Japan, rethinking linguistic education, reading the broadening of narrative perspectives. Um, last uh, year, let's say something more than last year, because it was in November 1219 at the Italian Institute of Culture in Tokyo. It was held the first uh, Italy-Japan University networking 
meeting and one of the main topics was exactly the um, reading of a possible cooperation strategy in order to withstand future, future effects of the population challenge in Italy and Japan from the point of view of institutions like ours who are daily working with young people. And another uh, uh, aspect which is uh, uh, somehow uh, in uh, my everyday working schedule is also um, uh, uh, studying uh, linguistic conditions for economical development. Professor Tanaka was talking about recent uh, um, immigration policies launched by Japan uh, also in terms of uh, um, uh, reaction to this kind of uh, um, uh, demographic challenges that we have been discussing this morning. And actually, uh, as a uh, person active in uh, uh, this kind of uh, actions in uh, sketching Japanese language education uh, policies, uh, it is very important to imagine, to figure out also uh, new ways of uh, um, education for uh, European citizens uh, who will be involved probably in a new kind of uh, migrations also in the direction of Japan in the future. And uh, as a um, uh, person who is uh, uh, doing research in uh, Japanese uh, uh, literature, of course, a change also in the narratives of the uh, character of the aging uh, uh, person in, within Japanese literature is something that attracts uh, my attention. Uh, of course, uh, there are um, sensible changes uh, comparing to the depiction of uh, eye aging characters in the pre-modern Japanese narratives. I am giving two examples, O Kagami and Munyo Zoshi, where the main characters uh, are grounding their authoritiveness, uh, author yes, <laughs> sorry, that word, authoritativeness in terms of um, being direct witness of what they uh, are narrating. Therefore, we have somehow the age and the aging, which is a, a kind of a topos for uh, describing uh, something as a direct witness. Of course, in the frame of cultural values in which Buddhism, Taoism, and Shinto also put a strong influence on the, the the final outfit of this uh, aging character, which is at this point largely literary in its uh, characteristics. A sea change uh, can be detected in modern and contemporary Japanese narratives of the so-called Bannen no Bungaku, which is the literature of the later years. Recently, Bannen no Bungaku is a kind of definition which is uh, going to be uh, somehow uh, left apart because it insists a little bit on kind of twilight years, while, as we will see in a few minutes, uh, uh, there is a, a completely new image of the elderly, which is coming out also from the, the new uh, Japanese literature works and not only uh, literary works. Um, of course, uh, it depends very much on the literary uh, principles of, uh, by specific literary movements, but simply also to the to the task of single writers, the um, aging characters come, come out in a very different way. But uh, I am quoting uh, especially those who, uh, which after the Second World War, uh, somehow uh, helped in um, reframing uh, the aging description also as an age of physical distress and caring difficulty. Uh, we have uh, three male authors, Niwa Fumio, Fukazawa Shichiro, uh, 
and is in a way Yasushi who uh, gave attention to this kind of uh, um, um, themes, but of course uh, also a kind of sous-genre of the uh, gender literature uh, in a society where the elderly care was largely uh, on the shoulders, uh, literally, of women. Ariyoshi Sawako in Ko Kotsu no Hito uh, depicts this kind of society where the caring of the elderly is largely um, um, uh, handled within the family and by the women. We are, uh, until this moment, we are in a situation where the aging uh, characters are somehow within uh, a frame that we could uh, expect. But then we have also uh, voices which are um, depicting different aspects of uh, uh, the aging uh, life. And for example, in this kind of uh, um, group of authors, uh, we can uh, uh, cite, we, we can quote as uh, Tanizaki Junichiro Futenro Jinniki, or for example, Kawabata Yasunari Nemureru Pijo, uh, because they are somehow paradigmatic of two possible approach of a theme like, for example, erotism in uh, aging life. Um, closer to the 21st century, realities uh, um, somehow uh, takes the ground in this kind of uh, narr narratives. And uh, uh, just to give you an example of what uh, can be found in uh, contemporary uh, novels or short stories uh, is a definition, a very long definition given by um, um, uh, uh, Lisette uh, Gerdat, which is um, a, a, a documentary, uh, critical, gerontological, philosophical approach. So you see that any aspect of uh, uh, the issue uh, can be somehow um, uh, used by the writers in order to uh, find new uh, aspects of uh, uh, the new uh, elderly um, characters. We have also uh, in this kind of production a good example of uh, uh, the new approach to this kind of uh, um, description in Sae Shuichi, uh, in a novel which is Koraku, uh, very interesting because it's describing uh, somehow the autumn of life, but uh, without renouncing a literary approach, it is also moving toward somehow a grounded, uh, well grounded in uh, everyday reality uh, about the story that uh, are uh, described. But what I would like to uh, uh, discuss today, maybe, it's uh, the new um, expression of uh, uh, contemporary literature about the elderly, uh, where we have very different voices uh, between Kaigi Bungaku, which is uh, literally literature of the elderly care, so very specific in the choice of the um, topics, and uh, this other um, Ikikata no Hon, which is a kind of uh, um, production, publishing, um, let's say, uh, how-to uh, manuals. And we have also uh, this kind of uh, uh, collection of uh, useful suggestions and so on about uh, uh, elderly life. Um, of course, uh, the most unconventional work of Kaigi Bungaku is uh, certainly Kaigi Newmon Introduction to Elderly Care, which was issued in 2004 by Mo 
Nobunorio, and he also won uh, a Kutagawa Sho, which is the uh, very prestigious uh, literary prize. The uh, point of interest is in this uh, story. Uh, of course, we have a description of uh, elderly care, but the main character is a, a young man um, who has an addiction to marijuana and is listening uh, only to hip hop, hard rock music, and he uh, experiments uh, the uh, care or the caring of her grandmother uh, in a form that very much can be assimilated to the novel of the formative years, or if you prefer, to a kind of Bildungsroman uh, in very atypical scenarios. Uh, very interesting is also the point of view of Sato Aiko, which was born in 1923. And when she was uh, uh, over 90 years old, uh, she uh, wrote this uh, um, book, Kyuju Sai, uh, somehow commenting yes, I am 90 years old, what's so great about it? And the, uh, the book was issues in, issued in 2017. So you, you see, she was uh, uh, almost 100 years old. Um, famous voices of this kind of ikikata no hon, are those of Setouchi Jakucho, Sono Hayako, Itsuki Hiroyuki, and others. As you see from the date of birth, they all are elderly people, elderly riders, who are um, writing about the experiences uh, of old life, old age, uh, insisting in positive aspects of aging, and uh, somehow uh, we have a sea change in the fact that at this point, aging is no longer described from outside. Not only this, not only we have writers who have uh, uh, who are describing this kind of uh, uh, let's say uh, new aspects uh, of uh, uh, an healthy uh, life, we have also um, examples of writers uh, who are winning the uh, Akutagawa Prize that I already mentioned, and that traditionally was considered the prize for new writers. They are winning it at, at an age which is constantly growing. For example, Kuroda Natsuko, who was born in 1937, won the Akutagawa Prize in 2012, and at the moment is the eldest recip recipient of the prize. But we also have other examples. For example, Wakatake Chisako, that uh, was born in 1954, because we... Uh, are assisting to a new phenomenon, the recipients of this literary prize for new writers um, is uh, um, always growing in terms of age. Not only um, literature has a strong trend uh, in uh, uh, putting the aging characters at the center of the narratives, we also have a lot of manga which are uh, going along this way. The recent bestseller is, of course, uh, Pekoro's no Hahani Aini Iku, Visiting Pekoro's Mother, which is a manga, um, a manga not completely because in the manga there are also pages of uh, uh, narratives uh, uh, and so on. But let's uh, decide that we can uh, call it a manga. Um, it turned uh, in the uh, following year uh, in a movie directed by Morisaki Azuma, and it is a very moving description of uh, um, middle-aged man uh, who is uh, um, uh, facing uh, the dementia of uh, his mother. Um, the, of course, this uh, account is autobiographical, and uh, particularly interesting. Um, 
Professoressa, le devo dire tre minuti. Tre minuti. We have uh, a lot of this uh, kind of manga uh, who are more or less in the narrative or practical side of the description. I here mention only Kusaka Riki, Herpman, because this is a series. It's not a single episode. As you see, it went on for nine years and it is interesting because it was uh, um, facing a lot of uh, uh, very real and everyday problems that uh, has to um, something to do with the elderly care um, exactly as we have the um, uh, manuals on uh, how to live uh, in a, a nice way the twilight years let's say we have also the manga that uh, um, are going along the way. So we have manga de Wakaru Kaigi, which is understanding elderly care with manga, which is also uh, quite a rich segment of uh, the uh, manga publishing nowadays. But now what I want, I mean, I was rushing through a lot of things uh, uh, that we can observe, but something that I'm asking to myself is that probably this trend um, among this um, production, a trend that it is interesting to be observed as a forum for social issues in the sense of Hilaria Guzman established in 1994, uh, both in literature and in manga, is uh, the trend of Kodoku Monogatari, what I try to name Kodoku Monogatari, which is narratives of the lonely. We have a um, good number of uh, works that are somehow describing the loneliness of the aging uh, as a good condition, as a um, somehow um, not disturbing situation for old people who are living alone. In a country where Kodokushi, the death alone, is a socially um, interesting phenomenon, I think that this tendency is to be studied in the next year because the question I pose is, is it a kind of the manifestation of surviving strategies or is it authentic acceptation of solitude, loneliness? So this, I'm sorry, uh, I hope I gave you an idea, but uh, this kind of trends uh, in uh, contemporary literature uh, is, um, are very rich and uh, many are the topics that can be uh, studied and researched also in the future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Vienna, and uh, she helped us in understanding how demographics is not a matter only of numbers, data, but is something that affects, as we said before, work, day-by-day -day life, but always more and more even culture. So culture and literature are affected by changing population. Um, uh, let me thank everybody for following all the works. I mean, and hopefully... Um, this was just a glimpse of the uh, topic and now we will go further with our discussion in future meetings and in publications. Uh, let me thanks again Luis Etos and Luis University and all its academics that helped uh, throughout the meeting. Uh, let me thanks of course the Japanese embassy in Rome, uh, especially Minister Girota who has followed all the works. Professor Tanaka who was ready to come to Rome last year uh, but uh, unluckily, we had to uh, stay now just online together, but we will uh, seek another chance to meet in person. And also two people behind the scenes from the embassy who, help, who helped us throughout the year, uh, Masamichi Yamashita and uh, Masatoshi Sugiura, who is now in Brussels, um, and the president of ISTA, Professor Blanjardo, who has been so patient. He's been with us. Uh, he has given us this lecture, and he's been with us for uh, two hours and a few minutes. So uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for being with us. And thanks also to the public. I mean, we have had hundred, more than 150 people connected live. Uh, I would say this is a great success for a seminar. 
first of all, and it's a great success for a seminar about demographics. Um, I'm happy uh, giving you this number. And uh, so uh, have a nice day. And thanks again for your time to everybody. Thank you.